Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian Y, and this is Foundations of Economics. In this set of videos, we will talk about a few different government policies and how they affect competitive markets. In this video, we'll be talking about price controls. There are two different types of price controls. Price ceilings set a maximum legal price for a good, and price floors set a minimum legal price for a good. Prices are not allowed to go over price ceilings, and they are not allowed to go under price floors. We are going to start with price ceilings. We'll be doing this in the context of our example supply and demand curves that we've been working with over the last several videos. Note that in our example, the equilibrium price is 6. I'll mark that off on our graph. Suppose that we make a price ceiling of 8. When we talk about price ceilings, I always draw a horizontal line across the graph at the ceiling. Remember that a price ceiling is a maximum price that the price is not allowed to go over. Since the equilibrium price is 6, and that's below the price ceiling, this particular price ceiling has no effect on the market. It's not allowed to go over 8, but it's not going to do that anyway. So we say that this price ceiling is non-binding. It doesn't do anything. Now suppose the price ceiling is 4. Again, I'm going to draw a horizontal line across the graph. This is a price ceiling, so the price is not allowed to go over 4. This time, there is going to be an effect because the market equilibrium price is 6. This is going to force the price in the market to come down to 4. At a price of 4, we have a quantity supplied of 10 and a quantity demanded of 30. Recall that when demand exceeds supply, we have a shortage. There's more people who want to buy than there is available quantity supplied. The difference in the two is the size of the shortage. In our case, the shortage is 20 units, 30 minus 10. Since this price ceiling has an effect on the market, we say it is a binding price ceiling. When the price ceiling is above the equilibrium price, it's non-binding, and when the price is below the equilibrium price, it is binding. This is not to say that a non-binding price ceiling could never become binding if there is a shift in supply or demand that causes the equilibrium price to go above the non-binding price ceiling, then it's going to become binding. Rent control is probably the most famous type of price ceiling. Rent control is a policy that prevents apartment rent from increasing year to year, most famously used in New York City. The goal of rent control is to get more affordable housing for lower income people. While this is not a bad goal, economists tend to oppose this as a policy. Let's look at the effects that rent control might have on the market. We'll start with the short run. Remember that in the short run, the demand and supply of apartments is relatively inelastic. The reason for that is, even if the price were to change, people still need an apartment. And building new apartments is a lengthy process, so that both the demand and supply are quite inelastic. If we place a binding price ceiling into this market, we see that there is a shortage. The demand exceeds supply, but it's a relatively small shortage. and doesn't pose too big of a problem. But in the long run, all supply and demand curves become more elastic. I'm going to continue to draw my price ceiling across, and we can see now that the shortage has become much bigger than before because there's more space in between the quantity demanded and quantity supplied. So in the long run, rent control can cause a big problem. Remember that in a competitive market, the price acts as a rationing mechanism. Everyone who's able to buy can buy at that price, and everybody who's willing to sell can also sell at that price. But when the price is not allowed to get to the equilibrium price, it's no longer able to do that. When there's a shortage, the suppliers have to find a way to pick and choose which of the buyers are able to get the apartments. This can lead to a lot of problems. Long waiting lists, lotteries, or even worse, discrimination. For example, families with children might be discriminated against. There might be racial discrimination and things like that. Another long-run problem is that landlords do not have an incentive to keep the apartments nice and updated because they are unable to raise the price. Why make improvements to an apartment when there's no profit to be made from doing so? 
we are now going to look at price floors. Price floors are a minimum legal price for a good. Returning to our example, suppose we have a price floor of four. Again, I'm going to draw a horizontal line across for our price floor. Since a price floor is the minimum allowed price for a good, and our equilibrium price is still six, this is now going to be a non-binding price floor, since the price would not go below four anyway. Again, it's totally possible for supply and demand to shift in a way that this becomes binding, but for now it's not. Now let's look at a price floor at eight. Since eight is above the equilibrium price of six, this is going to be a binding price floor. At eight, we have a quantity demanded of 10, and we have a quantity supplied of 30. The difference between those is a surplus. That is an excess of goods. Since 30 units are supplied, 10 units are demanded, the surplus will be 20 units. With a binding price floor, we again have inefficiency because the price fails to ration the good properly. This time though, it's the demand side that has to do the rationing. There's now more suppliers than there are buyers, and so the buyers can pick and choose who they buy from. This can again result in some discrimination. The most famous price floor happens in the labor market. The labor market is one of those markets for the factors of production. The labor market looks pretty similar to a normal market, except that the price is the wage and the quantity is the hours of labor. We'll call that L. Just like any market, the labor market has a demand curve, except this time the demand curve comes from firms who are trying to hire people, and it also has a supply curve, which this time comes from households, people like you and me who want to work. Just like any market, the labor market has an equilibrium wage and quantity of labor. The price floor in the labor market is the minimum wage. The minimum wage dates back to the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which established the first minimum wage of 25 cents an hour. That's gone up to the current federal minimum wage of $7.25, but 29 states have minimum wages above that. For example, in South Dakota, that minimum wage is $9.30 as of 2020. Whether or not the minimum wage is binding or not depends on the specific labor market we're thinking about. There is not just one labor market. There are different labor markets for different levels of education, different skill sets, and so forth. For most high-skilled labor markets, the minimum wage is well below the equilibrium wage, so it's non-binding. But there are certain labor markets where the minimum wage is binding. These are labor markets that tend to be lower skilled and lower experience labor markets. The most impacted group by the minimum wage is teenagers who have very little experience and relatively little time to develop work skills. When the minimum wage is binding, we get a surplus of labor. There are more people looking for jobs than there are people willing to hire. When there is a surplus in the labor market, that's where we get unemployment. It's worth mentioning here that while economists tend to oppose most forms of price controls like rent control, the minimum wage is a little bit more mixed in terms of opinion. This has been the basics of price controls, both ceilings and floors. In the next video, we will turn to taxes.